Let's embark on a discussion of chapter 12. We'll learn all about the cardiovascular system uh, of our textbook of physiology. And that will include three different parts which are quite distinct but do work together. We'll learn about the blood first, and we'll talk about the heart, kind of how it works, maybe a little bit about its anatomy, and then we'll put the whole thing together by adding the vascular system and then talking about how the blood and the heart and the cardiovascular system are all working together to, to support the homeostasis of the body. <clears throat> so first off, let's talk about blood. Um, blood is composed of a water component with a lot of solutes dissolved in it. That's called plasma. It's the sort of wheat yellow colored fluid shown here. In this case, we've let all the red blood cells sink to the bottom. The cells of blood are called the formed elements, and they're predominantly red blood cells that have hemoglobin in there that allow us to carry oxygen in the blood. So the fraction of the blood that's made up of red blood cells is called the hematocrit. So it's a, rel it's a relatively easy way to sort of assess the oxygen-carrying capacity of the blood. How many red blood cells are there by volume? compared to the total blood volume. So typically, there's about 45% red blood cells in the blood by volume. The white blood cells, incidentally, this, was, this packing effect of the blood cells was accomplished by a centrifuge, so it's a little different. But if you just let blood stand and prevent it from coagulating, the same thing will happen. Anyway, the white blood cells form this a, a thin layer right here on top of the red blood cells. Uh, all these components are separated by density in a centrifuge and the white blood cells form what's called the buffy coat. <clears throat> so the blood plasma, let's take a little closer look at what's in the blood plasma. Lots of solutes that are dissolved there. And we'll first tackle the electrolytes. <clears throat> electrolytes are ions, charged species that are in the blood. And they are by far the predominant solute by molarity, by particle number, not necessarily by mass. So that's a whole different thing. But anyway, sodium chloride is the most probably um, concentrated salt in the blood. It represents around 280 milliosmolar concentration out of a total 300 milliosmoles per liter in the, in the plasma. Chloride may not be quite that high, but anyway, it's a pretty high concentration. Um, low potassium, only 4.5 millimolar. And you already know that because when we talked about um, membrane potentials, we discovered that the extracellular potassium is right around 4.5 millimolar, and that's a very tightly regulated value uh, by through the action of aldosterone, as you know. Calcium is regulated at 9 millimolar in the plasma, and that's really important because it's of what an uh, incredible signaling molecule, the switch for, for exocytosis, the switch for muscle contraction, um, all kinds of signaling processes in different cell types in your body. Uh, regulated by parathyroid hormone, right? Homeostasis. Bicarbonate ion. There's about 24 millimolar bicarbonate ion in your blood, and that's a lot. And we'll talk about that at some point. It's a buffer. It's the buffer of the blood plasma, uh, the, probably one of two major buffers of the plasma. So we'll see how that works at some point. And then we have some other ions that perform various important functions in your body. So that's the electrolytes. Plasma proteins are quite plentiful, 8%. Now we're talking about weight. 8 grams of protein for every 100 mils of blood. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot more than there are of electrolytes, but yet in terms of particle number, because proteins are so large, the molarity is nothing like the concentration of the, of the electrolytes. So what are the proteins? Albumin is the most uh, prevalent protein, one of the many proteins produced by your liver. It's the factory from whence all the plasma proteins come, except one, as we'll see. We need those proteins in the plasma to hold water in the blood vessels by osmotic pressure. Blood capillaries are leaky. And the blood pressure itself in the capillaries is pushing water out. And it's the protein, a high protein concentration in the blood that holds a lot of that water in. So it all doesn't ooze out into your interstitial space. From your blood capillaries. There are numerous other proteins called globulins that have all a whole range of functions. Alpha and beta globulins, um, that's just an old fashioned name for blood proteins. Fibrinogen is really important because it's the protein that actually forms the fibrous connective tissue that has blood. 
when it clots or coagulates. So you've got a bunch of fibrinogen there at the ready, and we can then cause it to polymerize, polymerize sorry, at the, at the moment it's needed. Gamma globulins is the class of, of plasma proteins we know as antibodies. You hear a lot about antibodies today. Well, all those gamma globulins are made by lymphocytes of the immune system in response to infections in your body. So 15 to 20 percent of your blood proteins is gamma globulins. And again, those do not, those are the only ones that don't come from your liver. I think in this list, let's see what else we've got. I think in this list we should mention the clotting factors, all the proteins that allow the blood to clot. Right, fibrinogen is the mass of stuff that forms into a fibrous clot, but we have a whole series of proteins that initiate and orchestrate that clot uh, when we need it. <clears throat> a few other things. Nitrogenous substances other than proteins. Proteins have are made up of amino acids. And amino acids are primary amines, most of them. And they're strung together with peptide bonds. So all proteins have a lot of nitrogen, but there's some smaller molecules, nitrogenous substances in the blood, uh, urea, is the form in which nitrogen from uh, protein metabolism, amino acid metabolism, is excreted. CO2 mixed together, attached together with some, with some uh, NH2s can form urea. Uric acid is a product of nucleotide metabolism, right? The nucleotide bases that are uh, the, the, the components of your RNA and DNA. Creatinine comes from muscles. We know about muscle creatine because creatine phosphate is an energy storing compound, much like ATP, and in fact is used to restore ATP during short uh, muscle contraction bouts. And uh, creatinine is the excretion product of creatine metabolism. And finally, bilirubin. Bilirubin, as we'll see, comes from red blood cell um, um, recycling. Some nutrients, right? Some of just plain amino acids, glucose hormones, all kinds of good stuff is in your blood plasma, some lipids, some essential fats and so forth that we need for our cells, and respiratory gases. So these are the things that we find in plasma. Um, I'd like to identify this term right here, serum. Serum has a very specific meaning. It's what you get if you let blood coagulate, then you centrifuge down the clot, all the fibrin, and whatever sticks to it, and all the formed elements, of course, and you wind up with what's essentially like plasma without the fibrin in it, without the fibrinogen, but also a lot of clotting factors. So it's serum is a very specific product that results from letting blood clot and then taking out all the solid material. It's oftentimes abused. People often use serum and plasma interchangeably, and they shouldn't do that. So say plasma when you mean plasma when the blood has been anticoagulated or when it's in the body, and say serum when you're talking about, say, a blood product that's been manufactured by first letting the blood clot and then taking out the solids. The formed elements, again, that's what we call the, the cells in the plasma. We've already talked about red blood cells. Where do they come from? Like all of the, all of the, the formed elements, they come from the red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is this so-called spongy bone, uh, occupies the spongy bone in flat bones of your body. The heads are epiphyses of long bones. Um, so there's a lot of places where there's this, it looks like a sponge, only it's made of bone tissue. Um, that kind of bone has red bone marrow lodged within it. Within that red bone marrow are stem cells, which are immortal cells that can divide throughout your entire lifetime slowly, and their offspring can then give rise to lots of cell divisions that produce each one of these so-called lineages, right? Once, once the stem cell divides, uh, the, the daughter cells will um, differentiate or specialize, commit themselves to, to the production of very specific uh, types of white blood cells and red blood cells. So <clears throat> some of the daughter cells from stem cell uh, um, division produce red blood cells. That's called erythropoiesis. Hematopoiesis is what we call the formation of all the blood cells. Erythropoiesis is forming the, the red blood cells. And <clears throat> we can see that um, some of the daughter cells produced by stem cell division are form megakaryocytes. Karyo has to do with the complement of chromosomes in a normal cell. Megakaryocyte is the name given to these cells that are formed by multiple 
cells effectively that never separated after dividing their their chromatin right when a cell is about to divide it it replicates its chromosomes and then separates them to opposite poles and then you have cytokinesis separating of the cells well cytokinesis doesn't happen for a couple of rounds producing megakaryocytes here and these for some strange reason uh, these cells lurk in the red bone marrow and produce platelets broken off fragments of the cell packed with chemical filled granules or vesicles all right well we also have some other pathways to produce formed elements <clears throat> monocytes uh, are precursors to tissue macrophages monocytes circulate and, and go, leave the circulation eventually mature into, fa into phagocytes called macrophages neutrophils circulate normally in the, in the blood at all times until an infection or tissue injury takes place and then neutrophils go out by the by the boatload out into the tissues to fight infections eosinophils as we'll see later are granulocytes neutrophils eosinophils and basophils are granulocytes that contain um, granules in their cytoplasm uh, so we said neutrophils are phagocytes uh, eosinophils are um, cells that have something to do with um, allergies but their their physiological role is to defend us against um, parasitic worms that may find their their way into the plasma or, or start eating red blood cells and so forth basophils are very very rare white blood cells that um, uh, initiate inflammation when there's been tissue injury three granulocytes monocytes and lymphocytes are called a granulocytes they don't have any uh, obvious prominent granules or vesicles in their in their cytoplasm and lymphocytes are the cells of the adaptive immune system so we'll hopefully get a chance to talk about the adaptive immune system at some point erythrocytes are super soft elastic stretchy um, cells packed with hemoglobin and they're kind of dimpled on both sides in the middle and that that allows them to push their hemoglobin out to the perimeter so when they're squeezing their way in, in stacks through blood capillaries, all the hemoglobin is situated in the perimeter where the, the distance for diffusion of oxygen into the tissues is minimal. They're called biconcave discs because they have that little dimple on each side pushing the hemoglobin out to the periphery. They have no organelles at all, no nucleus, no mitochondria. They have enzymes in the, that allows them to form ATP. All cells need some ATP uh, for maintenance of the cytoskeleton, for example, its elasticity. Um, we have some um, glycolytic enzymes in the, in the cytoplasm that allows this. And um, there's also some antioxidants in red blood cells that can keep our cells in the right oxidation state. What is in the red blood cell for the most part? Well, hemoglobin, and you probably knew that. But here, hopefully, we'll be a little bit of an insight into the structure of hemoglobin. What is it actually? Well, a hemoglobin complex constitutes four globin or peptide chains. So these taffy-like looking things are chains of amino acids. And four of them assemble just spontaneously into this triad or tetrad, right? It's got quaternary structure. And then each um, globin has a heme group situated within it, this planar heterocyclic organic ring molecule here. And in the center of each heme is an iron atom in the plus two oxidation state, and that is the binding site for oxygen. So each hemoglobin can carry four oxygens when it's saturated with oxygen, we say. So again, where do red blood cells come from? They come from the red bone marrow through a process called erythropoiesis. And it's regulated by a hormone called erythropoietin, EPO you've probably heard of. When the kidneys become hypoxic, they release erythropoietin, which goes to the red bone marrow and, and jumps up the rate of maturation of red blood cells. So that's what controls the hematocrit, the concentration or quantity of red blood cells in the circulation. They circulate for about four months and they get all raggedy and tattered and and oxidized and, and macrophages in the spleen, especially, but also in the liver, recognize those aged red blood cells and phagocytize them and recycle all their, their components. So what happens to all those components? Just like we saw that hemoglobin complex, that's what we're talking about, right? That's all that's really in a red blood cell predominantly. The amino acids from all the globin chains are released into the blood, right? Digest those proteins right down. The iron 
from each heme group is transported to the liver bound to transferrin or to the red bone marrow. Actually, the majority of it is transported back to the red bone marrow for production of more red blood cells. If there's extra um, iron, it'll be stored in the liver, always bound to a, to a carrier protein because iron is super reactive, nasty stuff, uh, pretty poisonous. Also, we don't want iron to be free in the circulation because of heaven forbid any microorganisms get into the blood that we don't want there. Uh, they always need iron uh, for their uh, to produce their iron, their enzymes, I'm sorry, when they multiply. And, and one of the strategies of the body is to make that iron very hard to come by. <clears throat> heme groups. What happens to the hemes? Heme is the red pigment that makes hemoglobin red. And it gets converted by the macrophages to bilirubin. Now it's a yellow green pigment and it's avidly taken up by the liver so it doesn't stay in the circulation in any appreciable or appreciable amount it's taken right up by the liver and the liver cells place that um that um bilirubin into the bile which is then excreted or secreted into the intestine and then excreted in the feces so that's the fate of the bilirubin it'll ultimately get ultimately get turned into a brown substance called stercobilin by the action of bacteria in the gut um, that's what colors the feces actually what do you need to make uh, red blood cells? You need iron, right, to put into the heme groups. Um, you need lots of amino acids to make the protein, the globin chains. And, and it turns out you need some vitamins that are essential for, uh, for this rapid cell division associated with making oh, unbelievable numbers of red blood cells per second. Um, so you need vitamin B12, for example. Here's just a description of the... Of the um, Regulation of red blood cell production, if the kidneys become hypoxic, they release erythropoietin, which drives up the red blood cell synthesis and increases the, the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, which in turn has <clears throat> eliminates the hypoxic condition in the kidney. So having a linear diagram, I thought we should add this arrow in here because this is a negative feedback loop, right? Doesn't do, doesn't do any good to understand a loop by drawing a linear arrangement of events. So we have this, uh, we're going to knock down that stimulus. If the stimulus is hypoxia or decreasing oxygen in the blood, we're going to raise that oxygen back up. We're going to reduce that stimulus. Anyway. Um, some interesting clinical issues associated with erythropoietin. People that have certain kidney diseases don't produce erythropoietin. It's got a very serious problem, a life-threatening anemia. Not enough red blood cells, not enough oxygen carrying capacity, I should say. Some patients that have kidney failure in terms of being able to form urine when they go to get renal dialysis or hemodialysis uh, to get rid of the waste products from the blood that the kidneys can't deal with, uh, they often lose the erythropoietin or may lose the erythropoietin and have to have replacement uh, injections. Uh, athletes sometimes abuse erythropoietin. They inject uh, synthetic erythropoietin into the blood in order to give them an, a, an advantage in aerobic sports. Um, only the danger with that is that if there aren't knowledgeable enough and they take too much erythropoietin, the blood may become too viscous, causing um, strokes, blood clots, and possibly even eventually heart failure, because it's a lot of work for the heart to pump a more viscous solution. Testosterone enhances erythropoietin release and therefore RBC production, so men have higher hematocrits than women. And also, there's a lot of men uh, that take um, hormone replacement therapy. If their testosterone levels uh, begin to flag in middle age uh, that robs them of their energy levels and so forth so they may uh, be prescribed testosterone replacement therapy but it has to be carefully dosed to prevent this same problem with excess um, viscosity let's just finish up by talking about anemia anemia is uh, defined here's the definition i want you to use do not say anemia is not enough red blood cells that's one possible cause of anemia anemia is a decrease or an inadequacy in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Bam. Why? Maybe because there aren't enough red blood cells. Or maybe because the red blood cells don't have the appropriate complement of hemoglobin in them. So anyway, please use this definition. Um, what could cause uh, anemia? Well, one cause of anemia is a very, very interesting situation, which um, there's a single amino acid substitution, a mutation in the beta globin chain in, in hemoglobin forming what's called sickle hemoglobin, HBS. We often abbreviate hemoglobin as HB. Now we're calling this HBS 
And, and it, the problem with it is in the deoxy state, such as when you're exercising vigorously or it's very, very stressed out, um, you're using extra oxygen, more and more of the hemoglobin doesn't have oxygen bound to it. Well, in those conditions, it polymerizes and it then jams up in the blood vessels and actually lyses, bursts the red blood cells. Uh, and therefore, we can't keep up with the red blood cell production to replace those oftentimes. This is called a, within the context of, of, of sickle cell disease, it's called a crisis. When that happens, it's very excruciatingly painful and also very bad to have anemia. Um, you don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So here's the a, just a short part of the peptide or the amino acid sequence of the beta uh, globin chain. And then in sickle cell disease, there's one amino acid substituted, a, a glutamate. Glutamic acid is replaced by a valine amino acid. And now we have HBS and we have that sickling problem. Other causes of anemia? Aplastic anemia is a very, very serious condition in which the red bone marrow has stopped producing cells. And therefore, we don't have enough red blood cells. We don't have enough of any of the formed elements, and we're going to be in deep trouble. Um, but um, if the blood, if the bone marrow becomes damaged, or the, uh, the immune system attacks it, or something like that, we may have aplastic anemia. If all the red blood cells begin to lyse for one reason or another, we would have hemolytic anemia. And into that category lands sickle cell disease. Sickle cell anemia is a hemolytic anemia. Um, if you have a blood transfusion that's inappropriately matched, um, antibodies in the recipient's blood will attack and, and, and institute the lysis of red blood cells and you'll have a hemolytic anemia. Certain parasites and infections can cause hemolytic anemia. <clears throat> Hemorrhagic anemia means loss of blood, bleeding. You could have acute means sudden or immediate. If you have a, a severe trauma or surgery in which a lot of blood is lost, um, you'll have hemorrhagic anemia temporarily until we can replace that, that blood volume. Um, sometimes there's going to be a condition in which there's chronic bleeding, right? The, the hemorrhoids in your rectum may bleed, some veins may become damaged and start to bleed, and blood just constantly trickling out of your body. Or it could be in your esophagus or other places in your gastrointestinal system. People that have cirrhosis of the liver, a late stage degeneration of the liver caused by alcohol abuse or severe chronic hepatitis um, um, wind up with blood backing up from the liver into the digestive tract. All the venous blood from your GI tract goes first to the liver and then back to the venous circulation to be pumped around the body. So if that blood can't get through the liver, it backs up into the veins of the, of the GI tract and all these ripply things here are abnormal. They're bulging veins inside of your esophagus that should be smooth inside there. And, um, and with these veins sticking out, the process of swallowing chafes and chafes on them. And you can see some little sores that formed here and there would be some bleeding taking place. And the blood is just constantly trickling down and trickling down into the GI tract, causing an anemia. Well, eventually it will probably be what uh, kills a person with cirrhosis of the liver as they poison themselves with excess amino acid metabolism, forming ammonia. And, and, and poisoning the body. <clears throat> Renal anemia. If your kidney, as we mentioned just a second ago, can't produce erythropoietin, and therefore you don't have enough red blood cells, that's called renal anemia. If you don't have enough iron in your diet, or you can't absorb the iron because of a, bo a bowel condition, you'll have iron deficiency anemia. A lot of times women have iron deficiency anemia because they have every month a loss of a significant amount of blood that they have to replace. So they have an extra challenge in trying to make up that deficit in red blood cells. So they need a lot of extra iron and sometimes they may not have quite enough to, to get that done and they may be anemic. <clears throat> Pernicious anemia is a very serious condition, in particular to geriatric uh, population, elderly people. Um, in order to absorb vitamin B12 from the blood, you need a peptide produced by gland cells in the stomach called intrinsic factor. Stomach secretes intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor allows the, the epithelial cells in your intestine to take up vitamin B12. Without it, you can't. And therefore, without vitamin B12, as we saw, you can't produce adequate red blood cells and you'll have pernicious anemia. Macrocytes are an abnormal, oversized red blood cell that's, that occurs when you can't divide, the cells can't divide properly. <clears throat> abnormal hemoglobin um, this is a different way of classifying anemias and we already know that sickle cell anemia would fall in that because it's a mutation in the, in the, in the globin chain thalassemia is another genetic inherited disease 
in which there's a mutation in one of the globin chains. In effect, there, there's missing uh, one of the types of globin chains. So we have very um, pale red blood cells that, with, that are very fragile with this abnormal hemoglobin in there, and they're prone to lysis. Okay, <clears throat> white blood cells, just real quickly, what are they? Here is a list of all the white blood cells. The granulocytes, as we said, are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Agranulocytes, ones without vesicles in their cytoplasm, are monocytes and lymphocytes. Of course, macrophages aren't really circulating uh, on white blood cells. They're actually the progeny of, or the, uh, the uh, mature state of monocytes, so you really don't need to put them as a separate cell type in this list, in a sense. I have arranged the, the types of white blood cells which are also nicknamed leukocytes, which is a catch-all term for all the white blood cells, arrange them in order of prevalence. So by far, the majority of white blood cells are neutrophils. And again, those are circulating phagocytes that leave the circulation and at sites of inflammation and infection and go off and fight infection. They're phagocytes that can gobble up foreign substances, recognize them, phagocytose them, and then kill them. <clears throat> Lymphocytes are, are the next most populous white blood cell. T and B lymphocytes, or T and B cells, are cells of the immune system that forms adaptive immunity, specific responses to infectious agents that come into our body on a particular occasion, and they produce antibodies and they attack infected cells. Monocytes, again, are very large um, agranulocytes that circulate in your blood, they're the largest of all the white blood cells, and they leave the circulation periodically to repopulate macrophages in your connective tissues and so forth another type of cell that can recognize foreign agents in your body and phagocytize and kill them. <laughs> Eosinophils are antiparasites. They also have something to do with, uh, with, with, with um, allergy. People that have uh, a lot of allergies tend to have a lot of eosinophils present in their circulation more than a typical person would. Basophils are inflammatory mediators, a lot like mast cells. In this list probably should be mast cells. They're also a type of white blood cell that are full of granules, including histamine, while basophils also have histamine in them, and that they can release and initiate inflammation. Platelets aren't cells at all. They're fragments of megakaryocytes that have been released into the circulation, and they're important in blood coagulation. So we'll have a whole section to talk about coagulation or clotting of the blood, and that's when we'll, we'll learn a lot more about platelets. So join me next time as we go on to talk more about the cardiovascular system in chapter 2 of our discussion of, of, of chapter 12.